So first, I want to thank all of you for the uh, the invitation to come. Uh, I I get to go uh, to a variety of different places, you know, around the country, around the world, and give talks to you know other physicians, clinicians, researchers. Uh, but the thing I enjoy most uh, is coming to uh, address patients, uh, and it's because as uh, Dr. Gerstein said, uh, you're really the reason uh, we all do what we do. And I hope uh, you will take the opportunity to ask questions during the question sessions and grab each of us during the coffee breaks and the lunch and, and ask questions. Uh, it's really why I enjoy coming here. I, I like to be grabbed and, and have questions asked. I, I actually enjoy that. Um, I spent most of my career at the National Cancer Institute in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, uh, focusing on neuroendocrine tumors, uh, including pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoid tumors, uh, performing both uh, laboratory research in that regard as well as clinical care, uh, both uh, surgical care, I'm a surgical oncologist and endocrine surgeon, as well as the development of new drugs and agents and translating those uh, to care for patients as well. Uh, about two and a half years ago, I uprooted my family. Uh, some voted for the move, some were voting against the move, uh, sort of like our Congress. There was a little bit of a, a, a discord uh, that took place, but the consensus eventually was coming back to New York um, was going to be a good thing. I was born on Long Island in Long Beach, uh, uh, grew up on Long Island, and so this is a homecoming for me as well. Uh, two and a half years ago, uh, we uh, uh, initiated the Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care, a new cancer center in New York, uh, based in the Bronx, uh, easily accessible on the Hutchinson Parkway and uh, other routes in uh, to us. And as a part of that cancer center, uh, we have opened one of the few centers in the United States entirely focused on neuroendocrine tumors, uh, carcinoids, and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, pheochromocytomas, th thyroid cancer, et cetera. And in that center, uh, we have experts, uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, surgical oncologists that have a focus in endocrine surgery gastroenterologists, nurse navigators, nutritionists, all based in one physical plant, a freestanding uh, center uh, where we welcome uh, seeing patients uh, with uh, what are often thought at other centers to be rare diseases, but we know are more common uh, than people uh, appreciate. And, and so as I begin my talk, which is the role of surgery uh, in net cancer, it's in the context of uh, the delivery of care uh, for these types of tumors, like many other types of tumors, are best done in a multidisciplinary context. And we have not only surgeons in our practice, but uh, gastroenterologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, et cetera. Uh, I also want to thank... Uh, Dr. Gerstein, for the overview. Uh, it sort of sets the stage uh, for what I'm going to talk about, uh, which is uh, treatment approaches uh, for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And so, as was mentioned, uh, the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is increasing, and we don't completely understand uh, why that is, uh, why this line is going up. Certainly, part of it is due to better awareness uh, of the tumors uh, and better understanding of the diagnostic studies we can do to detect them, but this doesn't completely explain uh, the increasing incidence uh, of neuroendocrine tumors. What they are, uh, uh, are as uh, was explained in, in even uh, greater detail in the last talk, are uh, tumors that arise in cells which are destined to be factories, as it were, for the production of specific proteins, which are very important for normal functions uh, that take place uh, in the body. However, when uh, these, these cells go awry, they can form either well-differentiated or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, and these tumors ha can have profound uh, impact and be life-limiting. All neuroendocrine tumors have in common the ability to be stained for certain uh, neuroendocrine markers, and uh, among them are synaptophysin and chromogranin. This is just a stain taken of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that stained positive for synaptophysin and chromogranin. Pathologists use that to define that something is a neuroendocrine tumor. And then they can stain for specific types of proteins, in this case insulin and glucagon, two special proteins that can be made from these cells. 
the current state of the art is looking at these tumors histologically, which is we look at their cells to try to define what these tumors are. But really the future of how we're gonna define these tumors and how we're going to then be able to craft better therapies for them is by understanding the molecular basis of these tumors, understanding the genes that are turned on and off in these tumors that make them behave uniquely. You know, it's interesting, we lump <clears throat> cancers together by anatomic sites or by histology, you know, how these tumors look. But there are lung cancers, for example, often referred to as small cell lung cancers, that behave much more like neuroendocrine tumors than they do like other lung cancers, adenocarcinomas. And so grouping lung cancers by the organ in which they originate is probably not as efficient at understanding the biology of the tumors and how to treat those tumors as grouping tumors together by their molecular biology, what leads to the formation of those tumors. And I think we're really growing in leaps and bounds in our understanding as we have new tools for understanding what makes tumors work, what makes cells work, and I think that's really going to lead, and has already led, as I'll mention towards the end of the talk, to new strategies for treating these tumors, which is very exciting. So I'm going to very quickly just brush over this because it was done uh, much better with better slides uh, in the first talk. Uh, carcinoid tumors, which are one type of neuroendocrine tumors, can be found um, you know, in a variety of different parts of the body, and we often define them by foregut, midgut, and hindgut. And certainly those locations do influence the behavior of those tumors. However, I would posit that that was the best we had to understand these different uh, tumors and how they may behave differently, but perhaps we are going to learn more about these tumors beyond just where they're located by their molecular profiles. Carcinoid syndrome, as was mentioned, uh, is due to often metastases of these tumors to the liver because when the tumors are growing in the liver, the products they produce escape the detoxifying uh, activity of the liver, but they're not solely due to tumors that metastasize in the liver as tumors that arise in the lungs, bronchial carcinoids, can result in the carcinoid syndrome without liver metastases. And actually, some rectal carcinoids can do the same because they have a blood supply that bypasses the liver as a detoxifying organ. What we're really trying to prevent with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, with carcinoid tumors, is their metastatic spread, principally to the liver. These tumors can spread to lymph nodes, and those can be a marker of more aggressive behavior, but it's really when they spread to the liver that they can be life-limiting and can be really negatively impactful on patients that have these tumors. And this is really what we want to prevent. On one side, you see this is a resected specimen of a small bowel segment with a small bowel carcinoid. And on the other side, you can see the liver. This is, and I'm going to step from the microphone for a second, but hopefully adjust volume. Um, this is the liver here. You are looking at a patient. Their feet are coming out to you. The head is going into the screen. This here is the liver. The kidney is going to be down a little lower than the liver. Um, and what you see here is a tumor in the liver from a neuroendocrine primary tumor, in this case a carcinoid in the small bowel. And these tumors in the liver are very vascular tumors, and it's why it appears brighter, brighter white. Anything with blood vessels, that's a big blood vessel. Here's a big blood vessel. Looks very bright. We can also give contrast into the GI tract. This is a portion of the stomach and small bowel and make that look bright. But here, as you see in the liver, this bright area in the liver is a big tumor in the right lobe of the liver as a result of a metastatic carcinoid. So how do we manage these tumors? How do we treat them when they're first diagnosed? And a very, again, uh, a good overview and description of how subtle these tumors can be when they present and how you have to be very attuned to the types of symptoms that can be a part of these tumors. But once you confirm the diagnosis, how do you manage them? And for many years, decades, uh, neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoids were really surgical cancers, meaning that the most effective therapies for managing these tumors were surgery. We really didn't have very many tools in our tool chests or weapons in our armamentarium 
for fighting these tumors once they spread. We had few, uh, streptozocin, somatostatin, and somatostatin analogs. Uh, certainly some chemotherapies had some modest activity against these tumors, but really surgery was the mainstay for you know, resulting in long-term positive outcome and even cures in, in patients. However, that has begun to change now, and I'll talk a little bit about that. In the last year, um, there's been an incredible excitement in the field of managing neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoids in the number of new targeted agents that have now not only been recognized and validated in clinical trials, but approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in managing uh, patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. And that's a lot of excitement. It's even excitement for surgeons, and I'll explain why. Uh, as we move on. So this is a patient uh, that my colleague David Hughes, who's here with me uh, today, uh, uh, also a uh, surgical oncologist, endocrine surgeon who focuses on these endocrine tumors. This is a patient that uh, was referred to David um, with a diagnosis of a mass in the mesentery. And the mesentery is the blood supply to the intestines. It's what carries blood to intestines, it's what carries blood away, and it's where the lymph nodes live. Uh, that supply, there's also nerves in the mesentery as well. And I'm going to step to the uh, CT scan again just to show you what I mean by mesentery. These are loops of intestine. You can see they have contrast in them. And it's like a, a veil almost or a curtain that comes away from the bowel is this mesentery that has uh, blood vessels and lymph nodes uh, traveling in it. If you look right here, there's a lymph node in the mesentery that's big and just shouldn't be there. And what can that lymph node be? Well, there are a variety of things that can manifest in the lymph nodes that are tumors that arise in the intestines. It could be an adenocarcinoma, like a typical colon cancer or a small bowel cancer. It can be a lymphoma, uh, which can occur in the lymph nodes. But neuroendocrine tumors have a propensity to first go to lymph nodes before they spread distantly. And carcinoids are certainly a tumor like this. And what's very interesting about carcinoids unlike many other types of tumors, uh, is that the primary tumor can still be very small and difficult to detect, but the lymph nodes can be very large. And so they'll often present first with lymph node involvement before you even know where the primary is. And in fact, this lymph node here, with almost a spiraling of the blood vessels, you can see this little loop of blood vessel from the mesentery, sort of drawing the mesentery down towards the lymph node, is a very suggestive finding for a carcinoid tumor. And if you look at this next CT scan, you can actually see the primary. It's very subtle and wasn't picked up by the radiologist that looked at the CT scan, but knowing that this lymph node was very suggestive of a carcinoid, one can go back and review the scan, and if you look at this little loop of small bowel here, there's a small tumor, and carcinoids can be much smaller than this, but about a one centimeter tumor in the wall of the small bowel that turned out at operation to be a carcinoid tumor. And so these can be very subtle findings. You can look at that entire scan and, you know, this go through it and say, I don't see anything that looks unusual unless you really know what you're looking for. And so the management of a primary neuroendocrine tumor, in this case a small bowel carcinoid, and its lymph node metastases in the mesentery are managed by surgical resection. That region of small intestine is removed, that swath of curtain or mesentery that leads to the small intestine along with its lymph nodes is removed. And our hope is by extirpating that disease, no other sites of tumor exist in the body. But the reality is, more often than not, there are microscopic cells that have escaped the primary and the regional lymph nodes and have taken up residence someplace else. And the real challenge is, what can we give in addition to surgery to better manage that? I'm going to touch on that uh, towards the end of the talk. So for the primary tumors, Surgical resection has been the mainstay of therapy uh, since carcinoids uh, were first identified and neuroendocrine tumors were first identified. A very um, astute comment that was made in the first talk 
was the notion about pancreatic tumors and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors not being appropriately recognized for how frequently they can be found in the population and the consequences of those tumors. And we all hear about pancreatic cancer as being adenocarcinomas, and there are certainly a lot of uh, uh, celebrities. Uh, Michael Landon was a, a person uh, that uh, had pancreatic cancer, Patrick Swayze, uh, and both died of that disease. But neuroendocrine tumors also afflict folks that whose names you would know about. Steve Jobs, for example, uh, had a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor uh, and, uh, you know, uh, is suffered the consequences of that, has had multiple uh, approaches, surgical and other, uh, to treat that. And so pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are often the red-haired stepchild of pancreatic cancers, uh, but it's important to focus on those tumors as well because we have some very effective strategies and therapies to treat those patients. And those are often, when they're found as primary tumors, managed by surgical resection for the primary tumor. So how do we find out if these tumors have spread someplace else? And that's really when they become life-limiting. And there are still surgical options for patients when tumors have spread to other sites, most notably the liver. And so the way we can determine that is by having a means of following our patients after we resect the primaries. And some tumor markers were mentioned, chromogranin A or CGA, neuron-specific enolase or NSE or important blood-borne tumor markers that can be measured by taking a blood test. But there are also imaging studies, and most common among these is somatostatin receptor scintigraphy. Neuroendocrine tumors, not all of them, but many of them, express on their surface a receptor. The receptor is sort of like the lock for a lock and key. And there are proteins that signal through those receptors, like putting a key in a lock to unlock a door. That's how these receptors work with these proteins. And one such um, molecule that can fit as a key into a lock is somatostatin or octreotide. Somatostatin or octreotide can very effectively bind to a somatostatin receptor. And if we label it with the radioactivity, we can actually image it with a camera. And so somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, or octreotide scans, can be used to detect these tumors when they've spread to other sites. FDG PET scans can be used uh, for these types of tumors. Again, not as commonly used for carcinoids, but can be often used for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, pheochromocytomas, other types of neuroendocrine tumors. And there are other types of PET scans, actually, beyond FDG PET that can be used for these tumors as well, something called a DOPA. PET scan can be used for some of these tumors. But uh, again, anatomic imaging, computerized tomography or CT scan or mag magnetic resonance imaging or MRI scan is sort of the mainstay for detecting where these tumors are located. So as I mentioned, the surgical management for both carcinoids and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors for the primary tumors, that's the tumor that originates, is surgical resection. But surgical resection can also be applied to metastatic disease. These tumors can be functional or non-functional, as was mentioned in the first talk. What we mean by functional is they produce proteins that can cause effect. For example, a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor can make insulin. We call those often insulinomas, and high levels of insulin can drop blood sugar, making patients have dizzy spells, be forgetful, memory loss, blackouts, things like that. They can produce proteins like gastrin, which can drive ulcer formation in the GI tract, or produce uh, peptides uh, like vasoactive intestinal peptide, which can cause profound diarrhea, very watery diarrhea. But the fact is most of these tumors are silent. They don't produce proteins that we can uh, detect uh, related to a specific syndrome. Well-differentiated uh, pancreatic endocrine tumors, as well as non-functional or carcinoids, can all spread to the liver. And this just shows that the first site of recurrence or spread of these diseases is the liver in the majority of these patients, anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of patients. When they have a recurrence, the recurrence will be in the liver. So what do we do? Uh, when these tumors uh, present in the liver. If they've spread from their primary site, which I've already said we can manage with surgery, what do we do when they spread to the liver? So our greatest hope 
is that these tumors will be resectable. That means that we can actually go in surgically and remove them. The best chance for a sustained positive outcome for a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, whether it be pancreas in origin or small bowel in origin, is removal of those tumors in the liver. And removal can be either through surgical resection with a scalpel and other tools we use in the operating room, or by ablative therapies using radiofrequency or microwave ablation, either instead of or in addition to surgical resection. And a number of different studies have been performed looking at the effectiveness of aggressive surgical resection for these tumors when they spread to the liver. And uh, these uh, studies can often be small in number because this is not a common uh, tumor type. But you can have five-year survivals approaching 70% in some of these studies for aggressive surgical resection of these tumors. Uh, a multi-institutional, multinational study was recently published. This was actually in 2010 in the Annals of Surgical Oncology, led by the group at Hopkins, um, but a number of different centers around the United States and the world participated in this trial, and they actually looked at the surgical management of hepatic neuroendocrine tumors. This included carcinoids and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, um, and how patients did after these tumors were aggressively resected, either with surgery alone or surgery plus radiofrequency ablation. And what they found is if you looked overall, at overall survival, that is how long did patients live, the median survival, that is 50% of patients survived to this point, was 125 months. So if you think about that, 125 months is a little over 10 years uh, of survival. And so very, very good 10-year survival for patients with metastatic disease if they were amenable to aggressive surgical resection. Um, there are other uh, strategies uh, for carcinoid metastases and neuroendocrine tumor metastases, hepatic artery chemoembolization, staged embolization and surgical resection, and I'll leave that for some of our other speakers who are going to talk a little bit more about interventional uh, modalities that can be brought to bear on metastases. So I'd like to talk for a second about a case of mine. This was a 28-year-old uh, woman with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, who presented to me in 1996 with this uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in the head of her pancreas. She had no evidence of tumor anyplace else at that time, and I was able to remove her tumor with a pancreatic otorhinectomy, or what many folks would more commonly recognize as a Whipple resection. Nobody really does Whipple resections anymore. It's a bit of a misnomer. The operation Whipple did and popularized was a two-stage operation. It actually required two trips to the operating room to do. We call it the Whipple resection out of respect for Alan Whipple, who designed the operation, but nobody really does that operation anymore. It's probably better referred to as a Cameron operation, because what most people do is an operation popularized by John Cameron at Hopkins, which is a one-stage resection of a tumor in the head of the pancreas. And what many of us do that manage neuroendocrine tumors by doing these resections is what's referred to as a pylorus preserving pancreatic otorhinectomy because we believe it's better nutritionally for patients after they have the surgery. So none of us really does the operation that Whipple did, but it's a fun word to say, and so we still say we do Whipple resections. But it's a pancreatic otorhinectomy, which is a little harder to, to get your lips around than a Whipple. So this patient had a Whipple resection in 1996, and I followed her with serial scans, uh, always worried with these tumors, and hers was about five centimeters in size that they can recur in the liver. And in 1999, she looked pretty good, and 2003, she looked pretty good, but if you look at 2005, we begin to see a problem arising, and these are early arterial phase CT scans, which are very important to do for neuroendocrine tumors, because unless you do an arterial scan, it's very hard uh, to see these tumors. And you can see that we're seeing those contrast-enhancing tumors that I showed you earlier now in the right lobe uh, of her liver. Fortunately, uh, when we brought, and here's an, just another uh, shot of, uh, of 
uh, tumor in the liver here. When we brought her to the operating room, these tumors, and this is, uh, again, uh, looking at the liver, uh, patient's head is going into the screen, feet are coming out to you, I'm lifting up the right lobe of the liver, and this area right here is a tumor in the liver. And we were actually able to perform a resection of the right lobe of her liver. Uh, this is me holding up the right lobe of the liver. That's a very important blood vessel behind the liver called the vena cava, which we have to be very careful when we dissect the liver away from these blood vessels that they're not injured. Um, and since she had had a Whipple resection before, it made dissection of the blood vessels going into and out of the liver a little more challenging than it typically would be. But we were able to get control of those vessels and actually remove this section of her liver, which you can see here, leaving enough normal liver behind to maintain her liver function. And here's the normal liver left behind. And you can see there's if I can get the arrow going, plenty of normal liver left behind. And she did just fine uh, after this operation from a physiologic state. And here's the specimen that was removed and sent to our pathologist. And when you cut through this liver, you find that beyond just the tumors we saw, there are a lot of tiny little tumors also that were not readily apparent, like this one right here. And anyone that kids themselves and thinks that those tiny little tumors aren't also in the liver we left behind is doing just that. They're kidding themselves. And so while surgical resection works very well to remove the gross disease, we need something else that we can give these patients to prevent those tiny little tumors from growing into larger tumors. And in fact, I showed you the survival is terrific after doing this kind of surgery. But if you look out five and 10 years, although patients are surviving, roughly all of them have had tumor come back. 95% of patients undergoing surgical resection for tumors in the liver will have recurred by five years, although they'll live on average 125 months. So we have to be able to treat this micrometastatic disease as well. So I'm going to skip over that. That just shows that we can do liver transplants also with pretty good response. And you think, OK, if there's going to be these microscopic sites, just take the whole liver out and put a new liver in. The problem is the availability of liver organs to use for transplant and the fact that you have to be on immunosuppressive medications, which have their own consequences, um, makes liver transplant a less than routine or viable uh, fallback position for many patients. But what do we do for the patients that aren't candidates uh, for surgical resection, ones that have tumors in too many locations? And if you look at this patient here, you can see these tumors everywhere in the liver. And this is, again, me holding up the liver in the operating room. You can see there are tumor nodules throughout this patient's liver. So what are the options for these patients? Well, we still have regional therapy approaches for these patients. And we at uh, Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care are only, are only one of two institutions in the United States that offer the procedure that I'm about to describe to you. And this was a procedure developed at the National Cancer Institute in the mid-1990s under the leadership of Dr. Richard Alexander at the University of Maryland and Dr. Doug Fraker, now at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and I participated in designing this therapy as well in the uh, 16 years that I spent there. And what we do basically is we isolate the liver and attach it to a heart-lung machine. We actually don't remove the liver from the body. It's still sitting in the body. But we get control of the blood vessels going into and out of the liver. And we hook it up to a heart-lung machine that allows us to give very high doses of chemotherapy, doses well in excess of what a patient could tolerate intravenously. But because the liver is such a resilient organ, the liver will tolerate this therapy very well, in fact. Um, the tumors don't. The tumors don't like this at all, giving uh, agents at that concentration. And the rest of the blood supply is bypassed around the liver for the 60 minutes we do this treatment. And here's another shot of uh, holding up the liver. This is the vena cava behind the liver. We take down all blood vessels going into and out of the liver uh, to make certain there isn't any leakage of the chemotherapy anyplace else in the body. We carefully put catheters in these blood vessels that are leading into and out of the liver to deliver the chemotherapy and prevent it from going to other parts of the body. It's a very big uh, effort in the operating room. 
uh, with a team of very highly trained nurses, anesthesiologists, surgeons, etc., perfusionists to be able to do this procedure. And we published our results of doing this specifically for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We specifically applied this treatment to carcinoids and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases that were not resectable. This is an example of such a patient. You can see these tumors everywhere in the liver. There really would be no way to resect these and, leave, uh, and not leave tumor behind. The sites that we treated were mostly pancreas, but you can see the primaries were also in the lung, in the stomach, in the colon, in the small bowel, et cetera. Um, and uh, the dose of chemotherapy we gave was pretty standard for this type of procedure, and this just shows the various parameters of how we conducted the perfusion. The toxicities were very modest. Most of them were just chemical toxicities. That is to say, blood tests looked abnormal. But the patients themselves were usually out of the hospital within five or six days and back to their usual activities within a couple of weeks. Our overall response rate for this operative procedure was 50%. It meant 50% of our patients had shrinkage, measurable shrinkage of their tumors. And this is an example. This is a patient you can see a lot of these brightly lit MRI evidence of tumor throughout the liver. Twelve months later, no evidence of tumor. And these are tumors that were everywhere, could not have been surgically resected. And if you look at both our progression-free, that is, time to come back, but most importantly, overall survival. Again, these aren't patients that could be resected. Even our overall survival median was close to 50 months for patients that you otherwise would have said with the amount of disease in their liver, there's not much that we can do uh, for these patients. Well, you have to undergo an operation to get this therapy, and it's a surgical procedure, and I'm the type of surgeon that's of the mindset, I'd like to put myself out of business. I'd like it if I can hang up my scalpel forever and spend my days either hanging out with you socially, because folks often say to me they don't want to meet me professionally, or spending time trying to get my tour card for the senior golf tour. I don't play golf a lot, but I like it. And I'm one of those golfers that thinks the higher you score, the better, because you get to swing the stick more. Right? So it's a better afternoon that's spent outside. So I'd like nothing better than to be able to hang up my scalpel. So in an effort to try to make this a more uh, engaging procedure for patients where you don't have to go to the operating room and the ability to give repeated therapies, we are now doing these procedures percutaneously, meaning we can place a catheter in through the blood vessels without the need of surgery and isolate the liver using balloons as opposed to surgical clamps. And we also applied what's referred to as chemosaturation and percutaneous hepatic perfusion two neuroendocrine tumors. And we did a study, again at the National Cancer Institute, looking at our efficacy of giving a percutaneous approach to treat these tumors. And uh, basically what we did is we looked at 23 patients with neuroendocrine tumors. These are where those tumors were located and the number of lesions we saw in these patients. We treated them with multiple treatments, actually four treatments with this percutaneous approach using the same chemotherapy agent, melphalan, to do the treatment. And what we saw here was, again, a very good overall response rate. With the open procedure, about 50%. With the multiple repeated therapies we could do with percutaneous perfusion, close to 80% of our patients responded. Here's an example of one of those responses. You can see multiple tumors throughout the liver here in April. After two treatments, many of these tumors have gotten smaller, and by three, uh, four treatments, there are barely any tumors that one can detect on imaging. This was a patient with a functional tumor. This tumor was making a protein called glucagon, and this therapy was very effective not only at shrinking the tumors, but at bringing the glucagon levels back down to undetectable and completely eliminating the patient's symptoms. And here's an example of another patient with a poorly differentiated, we talked about well-differentiated versus poorly differentiated tumors, and the poorly differentiated ones being much more aggressive. You can see these multiple tumors throughout the liver are almost completely resolved, just little scars of the tumors left after uh, the treatment. Another example of that here. And again, when we looked at our median time to tumors coming back, again, microscopic disease being the Achilles heel, 39 months for this strategy. But our overall survival for this strategy 
of 40 months. So very comparable to what we saw with the open procedure without the need for surgery in these patients with very advanced disease to the liver. So I'm going to wrap up right now. I am coming to the, the, the sliding into home plate about why I'm so excited about the progress we've made with agents for neuroendocrine tumors. And I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about these from some of our other speakers, but just a couple of quick highlights. In the last year, a number of new agents have been added to our arsenal of therapies that we can give. Three of them that I'll just highlight very quickly are Everolimus, which is an agent that was typically used as an immunosuppressive, was just recently approved by the FDA for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Everolimus works through a pathway that we now understand to be very important for neuroendocrine tumors, the mTOR pathway, which is part of the dividend that we've all received from the investment in the Human Genome Project and better understanding genes involved in disease. Everolimus is a direct dividend of that pro uh, process. And Sinitinib, Sutent, an agent that blocks another type of receptor, again, another pathway that we learned was very important in these tumors. Uh, and uh, both Sutent and Everolimus are now approved for the management of uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors. This is Sutent improving both progression-free and overall survival compared to a sugar pill, uh, and this uh, is what led to uh, its approval. And certainly Everolimus as well, again, improving progression-free and overall survival. So why does a surgeon mention to you these important systemic therapies? These are pills that can be taken by mouth for treatment. And that's because where we're moving now with both liver perfusion and surgical resection are trials where we combine the ability of surgery to maximally debulk the big portions of tumor and then to give these agents after the surgical therapy to prevent the microscopic sites from growing. And we're actually hoping to open a trial next spring, this coming spring, 2012, where patients with resectable metastases to the liver will get resection and then receive Everolimus to determine whether or not that improves both the progression-free and overall survival. Clinical trials are very important, and all of you are probably interested in looking at them, et cetera, and I believe that's what is gonna hold the answers to future therapy. We currently have a clinical trial open at the Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care for patients with symptomatic carcinoid, that is diarrhea and flushing, using a new type of somatostatin analog called SOM230, which may be more effective and longer acting than typical somatostatin receptor targeted therapies. And so if you have or know of folks um, that uh, uh, have symptomatic carcinoid, please contact us afterwards and we'd be happy to evaluate patients for the trial. These are my collaborators both in the laboratory around the US and our clinical staff and to contact us, and as I said, we love uh, to talk to patients and uh, would love to talk to you here, myself or David Hughes. These are our contact uh, phone numbers, my email and David's email, and the website for our Center of Excellence in Endocrine and Neuroendocrine Tumors where you can find out more information about these diseases in the programs. And I thank you very much for your patience and attention.